Would it surprise you to learn that up to half of all seafarers during the 18th and 19th centuries were enslaved Africans? According to actual crew logs, one out of every six crew on Blackbeard's famous pirate ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, were in fact African, and historians today state that 30% is on the lower end. Many ships had 40 to 50% Africans, both freed and still enslaved. For this video, I'm going to talk about the intersection between three seemingly unrelated ideas, the pilots of trading ships, Cuban passports, and British tea, and show how all of these connect to the African slave trade. Kevin Dawson's enslaved ship pilots in the age of revolutions, challenging notions of race and slavery between the boundaries of land and sea, painted a different cultural geography, or in his words, an alternate territorial system in which the borders of nation states and kingdoms in the 19th century disappeared, replaced by a meritocratic system which didn't follow the rules or laws of countries, especially regarding the treatment of slaves. In fact, not only were slave pilots given privileges no other slave could dream of, but they were also a protected profession, even by the slave plantocracy who relied on these pilots to transport their goods around the world. Dawson explains in his essay that in ports like Charleston, South Carolina, bond people were the majority of the population, and pilots were given freedom to basically hire themselves out to ships as private entrepreneurs. He tells the story of an enslaved pilot who, in a fit of rage, attacked the captain of a ship he was working on. Not only was his life spared, eventually he was freed and became a slaveholder himself. David Sartorius, in his article Transitory Trust, Falsified Passports, Circulars, and Other Speculations in 19th Century Cuba, described the problems in personal passports and the rampant falsification of identification papers in the 19th century. He told the stories of three individuals, Genoveva Tondron, a Haitian emigre from the recently liberated Hispaniola who arrived in Cuba without papers and had to prove her faith in God in order to prevent deportation. Jose Hernandez, a serial criminal who was constantly traveling under false names, and George Howe, an American doctor who by accident hired himself onto a slave ship bound for Monrovia and Congo, ended up stranded in Cuba and had to bribe a customs official more than $600 to secure his travel back to Louisiana. Sartorius reveals a different world back in the 19th century, that in many ways, life back then had very similar challenges as we have today in traveling between countries. However, more than that, Sartorius shows us a riveting account of a paperless and ghostly Cuba that was front and center to the most heinous of human crimes, human trafficking. In Mark Harvey's Slavery, Indenture, and the Development of British Industrial Capitalism, he introduced the idea of triangular trade during the 19th century, that is, the interconnectedness of slaves, sugar, machinery, provisions, shipping, and guns. In his article, he explained that the entanglement of these various industries led Great Britain to, quote, econocide. As the diminishing returns of slavery increased, England had no other choice than to emancipate the slaves or else face financial ruin. As the demand for sweet drinks increased, so the demand for slaves increased. As the demand for slaves increased, so the demand for guns to trade for slaves increased. The severe conditions on sugar plantations, though, led to an increasingly high mortality rate, and with no other choice, England had to begin the process to emancipation. 